You're listening to Driving Law, a podcast by Kyla Lee about all things related to the rules of the road. Hello and welcome to another episode of Driving Law. I am Kyla Lee at Acumen Law and with me, my co-host, Paul Doroshenko. Well, I'm with you, but I'm not with you. You're in Las Vegas. And yeah. I'm in the office, so it's not quite the same. Yeah. Um, I'm in here working, working for a living, taking what I'm given, taking what I'm given because I'm working for a living. And uh, you're uh, enjoying your summer vacation. Yeah. You were just on vacation. I hope you recall. Yes. And like you, when I was on vacation, I worked, I conducted hearings. Um, you know, every night I, I did a bunch of, uh, a bunch of, uh, bookkeeping matters. So, you know, even when I'm not at work, I'm working. Yeah. Well, those are all things that need to happen. Have to get them done. Anyway, how is your, uh, how is your trip to Las Vegas going so far? Um, it is pretty fun. I've seen some interesting things. I've done some interesting things. I... Uh, gambled <laughs> and not lost a lot of money yet. <laughs> Good. Yet. <laughs> are you use, Are you using my system? Uh, yeah, I am using your system actually. Oh, good. And is it working for you? Your system is working. Yeah, I know my system works. I don't gamble, folks. I just I don't do it. I came up with a system. I know it works, but I don't believe in it. So um, here I am with Wrigley in the office working and I've been conducting hearings and I conducted a, and I got a revocation yesterday from what I conducted yesterday. And I got a revocation today from what I conducted today. What's so the <clears throat> work you did to set up the file. Well, I, and I appreciate that. So there you go. The uh, important thing is still succeeding for clients, even though it's, uh, it's uh, 50% of the IRP team. Yeah, you are, you are, you know, doing great. Good. Thank you. I need the compliment. I was searching for it. Yeah. Um, okay. So we have something that we promised our listeners that we would talk about last week. And that's that case out of Quebec of the woman who is the professional truck driver who was initially terminated by her employer on account of the fact that uh, they... Um, he had like a series of impaired driving charges and the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal or the Ontario Labor Tribunal ordered that she be reinstated. Fascinating. Reinstated. Not just compensation. No. Nope. Not compensation. Reinstated. And that may be the limits of the of the authority of that tribunal. Let's see. It's, uh, a, it's whatever the local tribunal is in Ontario. Um yeah. And so here, uh, there's a there's a great story on it on CBC. So essentially, what had happened was she was fired. She was on long haul trucking um, trip. Um, she worked for Group Robert in Quebec, and uh, she went into Pennsylvania, had nine beers while she was driving. Obviously, lost control of her truck, and uh, ended up. Uh, in a in a in a crash, uh, the consequences were uh, significant to the trucking company, who lost the truck uh, due to damage. Um, there were two stops that she made from Montreal to Pennsylvania to stop to buy a six pack. And after the crash, she sought medical attention, told her employer that she struggles with alcoholism, told the drinking problem, and they fired her. August 31st, and the crash was June 30th. So she knew, their employer knew about her disability for a couple months before taking action, or a month and a half, basically, before taking action, and then fired her. Yeah, it's claiming that they're firing her with cause. Yeah, well, she crashed the truck and she was drunk. Well, that was the cause, but, you know, that's, of course, you're firing with cause or without cause. Those are basically your two options, right? Now, they're unionized, which is really (laughs) interesting. Yeah. Uh, and their collective agreement as a member of the union has a provision that the penalty for drinking on the job while driving 
is immediate termination. But the arbitration, the labor arbitration board in Quebec said it doesn't matter because she suffers from a disability. So she was entitled to reasonable accommodation. And she provided evidence that they could have installed an interlock on her truck, which would have allowed her to continue working. Fascinating, huh? Hmm. Yeah. Back to something you always say. Which is? That, you know, the pathway to making interlocks the norm on vehicles is to start it on vehicles. Trucks. Commercial drivers. Yeah. Trucks and school buses. Um, those are the two easy ones, the low hanging fruit. And I was a little surprised when they, when they changed the motor vehicle act to include putting cameras in there, uh, trucks having to have cameras that are monitoring the driver basically and monitoring the road, um, that they didn't, uh, you know, that really allows you to catch somebody, I suppose, in circumstances, the police can collect that evidence, you know, the motor vehicle act permits that now too. Um, but it allows the person to commit the offense Whereas an interlock would stop them from it for being a risk. But you know what? The interlock, I think, from the employer's perspective, would also be um, be better. The um, And the reason for that is that the, so the interlock would get all the data from every time the person tried to blow in, tried to start the vehicle, and was unsuccessful in doing so. And because it's gathering that data, the employer would actually be able to say, look, like we we made this accommodation. We, you know, put them in alcohol counseling or whatever. Or they voluntarily attended treatment. Um, we installed an interlock on the truck. But turns out they were locked out of it or they, they, they blew positive results so often that deliveries couldn't be made on time. So we can now no longer accommodate them without undue hardship. Well, that's setting up firing them. Um, you know, that's that is you know, that, that it's lawful, right? It's giving them the chance, accommodating them to the extent that that they can be accommodated, and then, you know, they they you don't have to go beyond um go beyond what's reasonable to accommodate somebody, right? It can't it, close it, it is win win. Yeah. It is win win for the trucking companies for a hundred different reasons. They're not that expensive. And if yep. it was trucking companies were putting them in widely, they would be even cheaper. A. B, think about your insurance implications and think about like minor damage and things like that that are not insurable. There's lots of times the truck shows up back or the trailer shows up and there's some damage and you have no idea how the damage got on there. Maybe the driver doesn't have an idea of how the damage got on there, but I would bet dollars to donuts that there's a significant number of times that it's the driver is compromised slightly or, or, or greatly and they're driving as a result of consuming alcohol because we see it, right? We know this happens. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's damage to the truck or significant accidents. <clears throat> so liability and, uh, and even your own damage that you're, that you're taking on. And think of the uh, disincentive for drivers to drink and drive in those circumstances. If they know that there's an interlock, a lot of them won't do it. There will always be some who try and find some way around it. Uh, but the drivers are out there relatively independent in that sense. <clears throat> and so you are discouraging them, letting them know, look, this is a reasonable limit. It is a reasonable limit to put on an employee uh, driving a truck to have them have to provide a sample. Um, you know, it might you might have to give it a five minute window or a 10 minute window, even if you're driving a truck uh, to be able to do it. But still, you're being monitored. And so many of most many and most drivers would not do it. Wouldn't take that risk. Yeah. So the, the, the money saving, uh, they would pay for themselves. For sure. Hundo P. Yeah. I think it's, you know, I think it's worth doing. People should, uh, people should consider it. It's been 20 years I've been advocating for it. And I'm a drunk driving lawyer. And it's like 20 years that they could have been taking, taking away business from us. Uh, the service that we provide is to defend people in those circumstances. Um, and had they done it 20 years ago, you know. I just don't like, it's always school buses we hear, they make the news, right? Um, but there's lots of, uh, lots of other professional drivers. And when we're talking big rigs, um, you know, that's a, a huge risk on the road. Uh -huh. Yep. Yep. So there you go. 
that's our interesting topic. case. Yeah. Interesting case. I mean, the uh, so many reasons that it's interesting. But one of the things that I've come to terms with in the last few years is that it's almost impossible to fire somebody. Yes. Like you, you, you just have to pay people out. You fire them without cause and pay them out. That's the easiest way, because then, you know, you're, you're yeah. covered, as they say. Well, I was thinking about there was a, something in the news that caused me to think about this recently. That, 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 that Oh, it was uh, Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson. You know, you get a job, um, and um, <clears throat> then your employer starts collecting information that they can use over the years to use against you to fire you. And Tucker mm-hmm. Carlson is a, you know, complete asshole. Uh, but Fox News was building this big file, apparently, that they could use down the road for the when the day came that they had to fire him. And uh, there is a- when, when you started talking approach. about the, the inter- interlock maintaining that data, it's basically another step of that, of where, you know, here we are once again. What's the employer doing after they've? hired you they start collecting and maintaining information in a file with which they can eventually terminate you well yeah i mean why not we warned him back in 1999 yeah and we allowed it to continue for 20 years 20 yeah yeah hey, you okay. can only really so- you, you, you can't even fire somebody in the in the uh in the probationary period, really, without having a reason. And you're not supposed to have to have a reason, but that's the way she goes. Anyway. Here's the uh, here's the other thing I think we should talk about. I don't know if you saw this, but there was a TikTok video that went viral this week, which included, weirdly, um, a video of a person following somebody down the highway from Lillooet towards Merritt for 15 minutes. I mean, obviously, the TikTok video is not the full 15 minutes, but 15 minutes of following this car, which is swerving, it's driving completely in the wrong lane, it's driving on the shoulder, scraping up against the, the um, you know, divider that keeps you from falling off the side of the highway. Like, just terrible driving before eventually kind of leaving the roadway and down into a farmer's field and crashing into a tree. Yeah. I saw it. Um, I think most uh, people looking at it would video. presume. Most people looking at it would presume impairment. Um, the only other thing I could think of would be a significant medical condition, uh, or maybe their dog driving. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It was. Uh, it was. It was pretty bad evidence. I, I think they were saying that there was no cell service on part of that road. And this is something that you and I have talked about for a long time. I mean, this person was driving down the road. And clearly, they shouldn't have been driving down the road. And, and it was unsafe for everybody on the road and unsafe for them. And, you know, I always have some compassion for people. And who knows what's going on in this person's life. Uh, and maybe they were, you know, grossly impaired, as you might glean from the um, from the video. But it doesn't mean that they should they should die. And... You know, there's nothing to stop them for all that period because there is no cell service. And you and I have talked about this before, you know, the the lack of cell service on major routes in British Columbia. And, you know, if the if the BC liberals that now call themselves the BC United, and nobody knows them, and unfortunately that name change is going to lead to the demise of the party. But if they actually wanted to <clears throat> to make a promise to British Columbians that would um that would resonate with many people in rural BC. Uh, of course, they're all going to maybe already get those votes, but if they wanted to do something that would resonate with the people in rural BC, they would say, on these routes, we are going to ensure that there is cell phone service. You know, that would be an election promise to make. Highway 3, large portions of Highway 3, no cell phone service. Highway 5, north of Kamloops up to, to the Alberta border, large portions. Major highway, right? Major highway, large portions um, between uh, between uh, all the entire highway that runs from from Rupert to uh, to Prince George back up to to Jasper. Again, large portions, and this highway as well. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's 
it's dangerous. I think it's, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we should have cell phone service, not just the ability to report impaired drivers, because if you if you watch the video for those who, who are listening who haven't watched it, if you watch the video, that driving was so bad that people could have died. Like it was wrong side of the road, um, oncoming traffic, a, a fast moving highway with steep edges. Windy road. Yeah. Very tragic. And then what do you do? How do you alert anybody to the fact that that even the accidents taken place when you have no cell phone service? Yeah, That's um, I, I, yeah. In, in this, in this, and I want to, I hate to say it, in this day and age, in this time when we've had cell phones for uh, like three decades now, um, yeah. how it is that we don't have service on some of these major roads for extremely long periods? I mean, it took a long time to have service all the way on the Coca-Cola and it's not even complete, right? It's, there's still a few dead zones. Um, and you don't expect perfection, but to have, you know, there's, there's locations where you've got two hours of no service or longer from Bailmount to, to, uh, Clearwater, there's nothing, um, from Clearwater to Blue River, there's nothing, um, or from, uh, I, I, I got those two towns reversed, but in any event, um, it is a, it is a problem, um. It is a significant problem and it's a danger for road users in this province that they can't call in somebody and they can't deal with somebody in these circumstances. Yeah. Must have been terrifying for the onlookers and all the other vehicles coming, you know, coming the opposite direction with this car barreling at them. Yeah. I hope the car behind them, you know, use some strategies like putting on your four-way flashers or... Um, honking to alert people of the danger, but then you also you don't want to do that because you don't want to let the person in front of you think that you're, you know, following them or that you're going to get them in trouble. Yeah, I mean, you're on the other hand, you might want to alert them to the fact that you know they're back there and maybe they should pull over, and wake them up. <laughs> but, you know, I don't know. The problem is you can't win in those circumstances. Like if you're the person following. And that person in front of you is the, you know, presumed impaired driver suddenly does something different because of you. If you're the butterfly in the rainforest that flops your wings and they do something different, they cause an accident and kill five people. How are you going to feel about it? That you didn't run them off the road and they call an accident and they kill five people. You know, I don't know what I would do if I was in my truck, you know, in my F-150, I might have pulled up beside them and tried to push them into the ditch at a safe spot or try and speed past them and then impede their driving but yeah. if, you know driving with my family in the in the minivan no way well the police have given an update um if uh, the person who was driving well, obviously because they crashed in the, the farmer's field ultimately encountered by police thankfully had you know no injuries in the accident and uh according to the um merit police they have been uh, charged with impaired operation. The driver was a 36-year-old woman um, and uh, blew over the limit. I don't know how much over, but we know impaired and over 80 were the charges. Well, 36-year-old women are the biggest threat to society. Um, not very nice. That was a joke at your expense. Well, I'm not 36 anymore. So. No, I don't know. You pass for 28. Um, you still get ID'd when you're there in the States. So, uh, for somebody you could pass 21. Um, yeah, well, life has its challenges. And now this person, unfortunately has to deal with that. Challenges indeed. Um, okay. Moving on, Paul, very briefly, um, while we're on the subject of TikTok. I also wanted to bring people's attention to a fascinating TikTok video that I would love for people to just watch because I think it's worth watching. Um, and that is a video, I believe the title is um, uh, Legal Impaired Driving in England. Um, and it's clips of interviews from a news story that ran back in 1965 or 1967 when England brought in impaired driving laws. And it shows people doing the original drunk meter test, which I love um, because you know that I'm a drunk meter, um, and failing. And then the, the reporter asks, 
how many drinks have you had and and were you going to were you going to drive and you know this is going to be illegal starting on Monday what do you think about that and all these people who are, seem like they maybe have had a few too many are all saying that they think the law is ridiculous that they think they should be allowed to drive and they're perfectly fine and they've consumed a lot more alcohol and driven safely before there were some similar videos from the early 70s from Wyoming that were out there. I've seen both of, I've seen that one, the, the one from England. Um, but, uh, similar thing where people are like, this is my freedom. I should be entitled to have a beer in the car as I'm driving home from a day of work. Um, and, uh, and you know, all of these Brits, there was one in that TikTok video. There was one woman I've driven drunk in South Africa and, and uh, in <laughs> France and lists all the countries. All she's over the world. Yeah. Yeah. I've been safe all of these times. I've always made it home. Um, yeah, well, it's interesting how attitudes change, right? There was uh, original um, the iteration of criminal impaired driving is 100 years old um, in Canada. And then, of course, we were, we were quite ahead of the curve in many respects. In the 50s and 60s, we already had legislation along this line. Um, and the RCMP were... were early on did great work uh, and research in studying it, but boy, they've dropped the ball since. Um, for example, the, you know, the Alcocensor FST manual in BC tells the police nothing about vaping. It doesn't discuss vaping anywhere. And so you have no idea what the procedure should be when you pulled over a driver who's vaping. And we were ahead of the curve for a long time, and now we're way behind the curve. But that TikTok video is fascinating, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yep. The uh, you say something like that uh, anytime in the last thirty years, and you'd be uh, you'd be uh, pilloried. Know what I mean? Yes. Now I saw a TikTok video yesterday of a uh, of a black bear uh, killing a wild boar that was really upsetting viewed from a truck anyway if you want to see something really bizarre search for that okay i will i don't know that i don't know that i can handle that right now because i had a hog's head yesterday for dinner but yes well i can't handle the description of a hog's head so um enjoy your uh, las vegas hog's heads anything else we have to cover uh yes paul the ridiculous driver of the week A surprising bestseller? The pinpoint method of cross-examination is catching on. Law firms and new litigators across Canada have caught on to cross-examination the pinpoint method. Kyla Lee's straightforward handbook that teaches you effective cross-examination skills. Excellent. So who is the ridiculous driver of the week? Well, this is a man who somehow, I do not know how, managed to launch his car a toyota corolla modest not high speed car into a second floor bedroom of a pennsylvania home yes yes now i remember now i know the ridiculous driver of the week because i sent it to you the most interesting thing about that i sent it to you and 15 other people sent it to you as well well, yeah, of course, of course, the most interesting thing about that one, I mean, people send us ridiculous drivers of the week. Thank you listeners, um, for sending us ridiculous drivers of the week. Often I find them as well. Um, not necessarily even looking for them, but that individual apparently, according to the police did this intentionally and how you managed to get a Toyota Corolla into a second floor of a building. Yeah. Yeah, really. Um, now I don't know if this was a, like a assault with a weapon type situation. If it was a young man who was angry that he'd been dumped or who knows. Um, I, and maybe it was in there. I don't recall that being in the article, but the article did, um, indicate that the understanding was that this was an intentional act, uh, and that it, the driver was yeah. the, lawfully owning that car so it wasn't like a stolen car situation lawfully operating that vehicle um so yeah it's uh that's a new one 
I mean, I've thing- seen the. I've seen the odd case where, you know, the, a car has landed in a roof. It's a lot, you know, it's a house along the interstate or something. And somebody who's drunk and managed to do something stupid and land on the roof of a house or in the second floor of a house. But this was intentional Toyota Corolla intentionally placed in the second floor. It's an expensive tow, right? Yeah. The thing I love most about this is the photo of the car from the side of the house where you can see like the tow truck trying to get it down and there's sunflowers right at the at the like edge of the porch that the car is on top of the roof to the porch and the sunflowers are totally undisturbed oh well there you go well they're probably disturbed after they let the car out so i mean they can they'll have to be paid for the damage that was caused to the uh Damage caused to the house, and then I suppose there's be some sort of damages, uh, uh, you know, attributed to the lost sunflowers. You guys, free stuff. Anyway, that's our podcast, Paul. Well, that was quite enjoyable. Yeah, Kyla, yeah. have a great time there. Thanks. And if you have a driving law related issue, you can find us online at VancouverCriminalLaw.com or give us a call at 604 685 8889. And tune in next week to uh, catch up on another episode of Driving Law.